So uh, today, as, uh, as Jacques just said, we're going to talk about interaction with uh, the host genome. But in particularly, what is interesting here is the variation in the host genome. So at the, at the nucleotide level, so polymorphism SNPs in the host, that can have an effect or that can modulate what happens in particular in the gut. But we'll see a few examples of not necessarily limited to the gut. So uh, this is just a brief outline. Basically, we'll go over some of the measures of the microbiome that uh, will be assessed and that we're going to try to correlate or associate with the genetic variants in the human. And uh, we're going to go through uh, three different kinds of host interaction in this concept. The first one is how the human SNPs, the human variations, can affect the gut microbiome. So in broad terms, as, as you can conceive of. Uh, the second one is how the gut microbiome can interact, how drugs have an effect on the body, and vice versa. And I'll give you a few examples of that. Uh, but also, we're going to end with a new kind of analysis, which I think is really exciting. It's a, kind of work where you're doing genome to genome. It's like GWAS to GWAS analysis, looking at genetic variants throughout the genome in the human versus genetic variants throughout the genome of a bug. <clears throat> so before we go through some of those examples, let's start with a few words of wisdom. So first of all, the major differences between the human genome and uh, the human microbiome. And I'm, I'm sure that by now you're quite familiar with the human microbiome, which has been the, the topic of conversation. So when we're considering the human genome, obviously there's only one genome and it's stable. And so when we do analyses with that, we're basically taking the DNA from anywhere. It could be buccal swab, it could be blood, and basically we assume that the genome is going to be stable and that the variation in that genome represents the variation we had at birth and represents a variation that is having an impact on our health throughout the lifespan. But in the human microbiome, of course, there are many genomes and uh, recombination occurs. So somatic recombination in human is not that frequent and when it happens, we tend to be concerned. But in the microbiome, it does happen, and it happens, uh, it can happen independently of reproduction. And so funny things can happen, and also uh, the human microbiome will change in response to environment, so it, it can evolve, it can adapt to changes. This is definitely not something that is happening to the human genome, which is fairly stable. And so those are some of the, of the highlights of the difference. Now, when we do genetic association, when we're trying to establish a correlation between the human variation and the microbiome, we're going to have to define what we want to test. So what we call in statistics the endpoint or the outcome or the dependent variable. What are we trying to model? So in broad terms, this is what can be modeled, and this I hope you're familiar with. So hopefully this is the kind of outcomes you'll, you've been working with. So we can be interested in the diversity of the microbiome. This can be characterized as alpha diversity, beta diversity. We may be interested in the abundance of a specific, of a specific species, so how much of one species is present. And how does that correlate with the human genetic variant? So remember, those are the outcomes. Those, this is what we're trying to model in the microbiome. And we may be interested in functional profiling. So instead of asking how diverse it is or how much of one bug is present, we may be interested in asking what does it do? Regardless of what what the bugs are behind it, but what is the function? And this may be performed in a different a number of different ways. And we're going to go through a few examples of that, but I'm sure you're familiar with that by now. And of course, we may be interested in the stream level 
variation. So if we take one strain, that strain will have variability, and that variability will be dynamic over time. And we may be interested in using that as an endpoint. How does the human variation associate with specific variants in the bug of interest as it mutates over time? Okay. A um, few last words of wisdom. Uh, so what would be the advantages or what are the distinctions between doing microbial functional profiling versus just abundance? Uh, well, when we work, when we do statistical associations, as you know, your outcome that you're trying to model, you want it to be as stable and as replicable as possible. You want the variability within individuals and between individuals to not be so great that you can't model it. Okay, so some variability is essential, otherwise you can't, you can't model anything. But too much variability that is explained by unknown factors is just too much. So when we're looking at the abundance of specific species, we know, and you probably know this, that there's a lot of variability even within an individual and between individual. And the idea of doing functional profiling is that we're attempting to reduce that variability, where it's, in a way, we're trying to reduce features, to reduce error that couldn't be accounted for. <clears throat> so I think, I think that's the, the, the major aspect of why one would be interested in functional profiling. Okay, so first example, and so this is an example of how uh, genetic variation in humans and people uh, is modulating the microbiome. And this is the, I don't know if any of you prepared for this lecture, but I saw on the poster that there was a, 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 a reading that was assigned to, to the course. And this is the paper of the reading. Anybody looked at it? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Of course. <laughs> of course. So Jacques cho chose this paper, and uh, it's a uh, it's a it's a good paper. It's not my favorite, <laughs> Jacques, but we're going to go over it. So it was published in an issue of Nature Genetics in November 2016, and in that issue, in that specific issue, they had three papers back to back on this specific topic of how genetic variation can modulate the microbiome. And this is one of them. And we're going to see a second one. We're not going to see all three. We're just going to look at, at two of them. And it's going to give you a pretty good idea as to how this can happen. So this one is very simply called uh, the effects of host genetics on the microbiome. So what did they do? <clears throat> well, first of all, when we're studying uh, human variation in the host, we need large numbers. And uh, this is in the world of genome-wide association studies, GWAS. We typically work with large cohorts. And here they have what would be considered a small cohort on G on the, in the GWAS world. So typically when we do GWAS in order to be published in Nature Genetics those days, we need cohorts of above 150,000 samples. Okay, so this is a smallish cohort. Still is providing interesting results, and I think the reason why those three papers made it into Nature Genetics is that it's because of the novelty. Just the, the mere fact of being able to tackle all of the variation, defining the outcome properly. So this was of high interest, in, and that's why it made it there. So in the study, uh, it's uh, 1,500 individuals coming for, from three cohorts. And the three cohorts are homogeneous in terms of the geographical origin of the people sampled. They, they're Dutch cohorts. And they use a funny statistical approach uh, in the model, and that's why I said it's not my, my favorite paper. Uh, they used like a staged approach. They had a discovery cohort, and then they had replication cohorts. This is the kind of statistical analysis we used to do in the GWAS world 10 or 15 years ago. Nowadays, we tend to lump all the cohorts together, over 100,000 samples, and do a big meta-analysis and take the results at face value. You get the most power. When you do staged analysis, what happens is that at every stage, 
whenever you ignore to look at something, you obviously you lose power. If you're not looking at it, there's no chance you're going to find association with it. So the most amount of power you can have in a statistical analysis is if you put all your samples together. So here they use this stage approach. Okay, so they did germline genotyping. So basically they drew blood from those patients. They had, it was a cord already existing. I think they already had the blood. And uh, they uh, genotyped. And this is typically what is done in the GWAS world. So you extract DNA, and they did genotyping. And in this particular study, they genotype less than a million SNPs. But as you see here, I said 8 million SNPs were tested sequentially. So what they did is a very standard procedure. And that's one of the, dis the differences between the microbiome and the human genome analyses is that in the human genome analyses, we have very standard procedures. Things are done, things that methods, approaches that we use have been tested and validated and, and there's uh, robust documentation that, as to what is the best statistical approach to use. So this is a very standard way of doing a genetic analysis in humans. They genotype one million SNPs and then they imputed probabilistically, the genotypes of unseen SNPs based on external reference samples from the thousand genome. So thousands of genomes have been sequenced, and those references are available in the public domain. So when you have genotyping on a subset of SNPs, you may ask, given my SNPs, what's the probability of unseen SNPs? And you assign a probability to those genotypes, and you include those in your analyses. So that's what was done here. <clears throat> yes, question. Um, so, I'm just curious about your opinion on this, because you know, we're talking about the implication uh, of unseen genotypes. So, I've always wondered about this, because the imputation is based on your observations, so it's not really independent of anything. So, do you believe? Oh, I sure do, yeah. So we've been using that for many years in my group and in many groups. I'm, I'm no exception. And the way it works is that, as you know, the human genome is, uh, <clears throat> is not totally random. It's not like assigning SNPs at random. Because of the lineage of the history of the, of the people, of the populations, the, it, the chromosomes are shuffled in, 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 in chunks. And those chunks create linkages equilibrium in the human genome, and we can exploit that uh, linkage equilibrium to infer the probability of a neighboring SNP unseen but so close that we're pretty confident as to what it would have been. And uh, we can reconstruct those probabilistic uh, predictions based on haplotypes, not only on a single SNP, but you're, you're actually using a series of haplotypes, and you're asking, how many times have we seen this particular combination, and what's the most likely um, SNPs in between those combined SNPs? So it works very well. And in my group, we made discoveries in the past based on imputed SNPs. And of course, I'm not going to publication until we validate the imputation. And each time we did, the correlation is super high. Just a few glitches here and there, but it has a minor impact on the statistics. Because remember, the models that we use for association take into account the probability of that value being correct or not. So it's all weighted out. Don't be in your as well. Maybe I'm wrong, but we have like the, there's real blocks of haplotypes in the human genome, around like 30,000 base pairs. So that probably helps in the imputation as well. It helps, yeah. I, it's totally different from the microbiome world. Not sure. In the microbiome, there are uh, selection pressures that vary, and it's very dynamic, and it's a totally different environment. In humans, the, of course, the linkage equilibrium patterns will vary from population to population. So there are populations that, are, that have more diversity and populations that have less. And we know that allele frequencies will differ from one population to another. And so that's also very relevant. So whenever we do genetic analyses in humans, the most important covariates used in our association modeling is some sort of representation of the geographical origin of the samples. Otherwise, we could get confounding.
based on, you know, more diseases in some population, and we just assume that because the SNP is more present, the SNP is causal, but it's not causal. So those situations may occur in human associations, and we have to take that into account. Uh, sorry. Yes? This, this could be a very basic question, but I'm, inter like, I'm curious about your last comment. How does that work if people are from mixed origins? Okay, so how that works, I think it's, uh, you use similar approaches in the microbiome, so basically what we do is we take, we try to take as homogeneous a group as possible, so let's say we define an, our analysis, if, if I'm doing an analysis and 95% of my samples are Caucasian and 5% would be of mixed origin, Asian, African origin, then I, because the representation of different population is so small, I may choose to ignore it. Otherwise, I wouldn't be able to model it properly. If I have a good representation, it would be a different story. But if it's dominate, if there's a one dominating population, I may choose to homogenize my set and analyze this. And but that's not the end of the story. You still need to take into account the population structure within that broad definition of Caucasian. And the way we do that is we typically use principal component analysis based on all SNPs throughout the genome or selection of SNPs throughout the genome. And we, we reconstruct the orthogonal simil similarities between the individuals. And we use that as covariates in our model. That's how it's done. Okay. So back to our... Uh, GWAS to microbiome analysis. So they did a very typical GWAS approach that was based on 8 million SNPs. And they did uh, gut microbiome shotgun sequencing. The outcomes of interest, and, and remember we saw what are we trying to model in the microbiome that is going to be the target of our model. They, they used different uh, factors. So one thing they looked at was just the abundance of different microbial taxonomies, and they defined over 200 such species. And then they looked at functional units, defined it using different approaches, and they had over a thousand different functional units <coughs> that they were modeling. So how many t statistical tests are we talking about here? We're talking about 8 million SNPs. Each one of those 8 million SNPs, we're going to test with over 200 species. So that's already 8 million by 200, plus 8 million by 1,000 for each of the functional units. So when we do multiple testing like this, we expose ourselves to false positive association just because we're testing multiple, 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 multiple times. And we need to adjust for that multiple testing. Am I going to get a microphone? Oh, yeah. Super. So, in this paper, and the reason why I was so concerned about this paper is that the approach they use for multiple testing is unusual, for adjustment for multiple testing is unusual, and in the methods section of the article, if you ever get curious enough to go look into it, they actually have almost a full page of justification of how they use multiple testing, because what they have used is statistic, um, traditional approach to correction, none of this would have passed the, the, the threshold of evidence. Now, what about covariates? So the covariates that they used here were limited, and I'm going to show you a different example right after where the covariates are more extensive. Here, they simply limited their analyses to adjustment for Asian sex. Okay, and it's not, they didn't, actually I wrote covariates, but they didn't even model those things as covariates. They uh, normalized their outcomes, normalized based on age and sex. Okay, so it was taken into account into the approach. What did they get? So this is the results. We're looking at a very typical classical display of results for uh, genome-wide association studies. It's called the Manhattan plot. So those blue dots represent p-values. So we should be looking at 8 million p-values, or even more. I think they simplified the plot. It would be too dense on the page. And they drew a line, and that's the significant line. So you will understand that the higher, the more significant. The higher, 
the smaller the p-value, they actually use the log 10, negative log 10 of the p-value. So the higher, the smaller. And they're telling us that, uh, I'm not sure how this works, that everything that passes the line would be significant. Is this on? Does this work? It's a fake. It's a sham. <laughs> Question. Yeah. Uh, I have heard that there was like a consensus on the GWAS field that the threshold of p-value was to be 10 to minus 8. Correct. So in the GWAS world, the threshold for significance is 10 to the negative 8. This represents approximately, correction for approximately how many multiple tests? Approximately 1 million. 5 times 10 to the negative 8 is correction for approximately 1 million genome-wide statistical tests. We used 8 million. Why are we adjusting for 1 million? Because there is correlation between the SNFs and the human genome. And also so the they're not... Taxa. That's a different way. <laughs> so the, the SNFs are not independent test. Each individual SNP is not entirely independent from its neighboring SNP. And we, we don't want to overcorrect, otherwise we'll never publish in Nature Genetics. So, <laughs> so we use that standard, and it's been broadly accepted that we adjust for approximately one million tests when we do a genome-wide study, regardless, really, of how many SNPs we use. Now, clearly here, they did not use that uh, significant, or they did, but not taking into account the multiple species and the multiple functional units that they tested for. And this is justified in the paper through the staged approach that they used. Okay, so any more questions on this plot? Okay, we're moving on. I didn't really want to go through each and every single result they have. I think this is not the point. Today, let's try to focus on the conception, understanding how those studies are conceived and how one would go about testing those studies. But just to highlight uh, one result that they, that they highlighted in their, in their approach. And it's interesting that they decide to highlight that because it didn't directly uh, stem out from their genome-wide statistical approach. It actually is the result of candidate genes that they had pre-specified saying, oh, we're also going to look at those genes because they have been reported in the past. And this is one example. It's the lactase gene, LCT, in human. We're talking about the gene in the human. And this gene in human is known, and it's broadly established that it is associated with adult ability to digest milk, so adult expression of lactase. And uh, they wanted to see whether that gene would uh, modulate the gut microbiome. And uh, they say, well, we have some interesting signal here. And what they see is that people, individuals in this study, who were homozygous GG at that specific SNP previously known to be modulating lactase in adults, they had higher levels of one bacteria, Bifidobacterium abundance. Okay, and they tested the results in their three cohorts. They had three cohorts in their stage design. But what is particularly interesting in this model is that they saw what they call an interaction effect with the consumption of dairy products. So, in fact, that association was mostly apparent in individuals who had higher intake of dairy products. So, if the individuals had low intake of dairy product, then they did not see that abundance, the correlation with abundance. But in the, as the individuals were taking in more dairy products in a day, then they saw the separation. And they did a statistical test for interaction, and the statistical interaction was significant. This is probably the highlight of the results. Questions on this interaction? It's quite elegant. Yeah. Actually, sorry, it's a question. Oh, fine. Oh, you don't have a question? I have a different question. Go ahead. Okay. Um, are the GWAS data and metadata available? Most of them, yeah. I, I think they are. Because I found the microbiome data, but sometimes getting the 
Oh, oh, the host DNA. Maybe they, so usually with the host DNA, what they typically do is they publish the summary statistics. So you don't get the individual level data of the genotypes, but you'll get the beta value uh, for the association of each endpoint, not knowing how each individual contributed to that beta term. And the reason why they do that is to predict, protect the identity and the, of the individuals, and we can still use the, the statistical better terms to do meta-analyses. And we, actually, it's funny, it's interesting, the amount of things you can do with uh, summary statistics. You can dissect them, you can, so it's still quite variable, valuable. Yeah, question? Um, so, I haven't read the papers, so I'm going to ask you about the interaction itself. Um, how did you go about testing that? Uh, just the, um, the product of the genotype times the intake of the area and looking at the yeah. product. Well, basically, it's quite simple. So you have your outcome, and so the outcome here is just the abundance. And so you're testing for association with your SNP, and your SNP is basically dichotomous here. You have GG versus AG and AA, so you have two categories. So let's say 0, 1, or reverse, 1, 0. And it's a regression model. And you add your, your, your diet. And here the diet is levels of uh, portions of milk. And so you may have different levels. And then you add an interaction term. And so in statistics, it's just the multiplication of your things, and so you have the, your interaction term. And you can report the p-value here, and the p-value they reported was, was significant. <laughs> so that's how you model it. And this was a meta-analysis because there were differences in the, how the diet was captured in the three cohorts, and so it's a meta-analysis p-value. So it is saying is that it's a multiplicative effect rather than a repetitive effect, so the more, the more you... It's a GLM, it could be a super additive effect. Yes? Uh, are they looking in this kind of studies, uh, interaction between host SNPs, like uh, to check if there is interaction between multiple SNPs or a joint SNP effect, because this is very complex trait, so it's less uh, probable that only one snake can have an effect on the... Okay, so that's a very ambitious question. So we're asking, are there, throughout the 8 million SNFs, how are they, you know, modulating the outcome? But you want to take it one step further. Any of the 8 million, in interaction with any other of the 8 million, modeling your outcome in 1,500 people? I think that maybe in the future, when we put all of those data sets together, we may start tackling those questions. So typically, gene-gene interaction models have been attempted in the GWAS world, but not been very successful. So typically, we'll do a targeted gene-gene interaction. If we have a very good reason to believe that two genes would interact with together, then we'll model that specific interaction, but not necessarily go out fishing for any SNP-SNP interaction, because it's, uh, there are too many possibilities. I mean, it can take uh, all the SNPs which have the highest odds ratio. So the question is, can we take only the SNPs that have the highest effect size as, as candidates for the gene-gene and SNP-SNP interaction? We can. But this brings me back to my comment initially about stage design. Whenever you do a stage design, anything you're not taking to the second stage, you lose power to discover. Yeah. Uh, question. So how exactly did you take into account the, the just remember, this is not my study. How did they take into account the three cohorts? Uh, so it was a meta-analysis. Oh, in, in the GWAS approach, it was a stage design. Anything that passed is a certain p-value in the first cohort. Then they would test in the second cohort. Uh, and then for this interaction model, they tested it in the three cohorts and used the combined. In a meta-analysis, they combined the better terms and got a p-value on a combined approach using meta-analysis. Question. I have a question regarding the SNPs, which have uh, a minority frequency less than 5%. Is okay. There, is there any value to study them? Because in okay, so there is no 
enough uh, statistical power to include them. Okay, the last yes. question on this topic, and then we'll move on. The question is, how do we deal with SNPs that have a small allele frequency? And this is a question that's probably very relevant to your microbiome analysis. What happens when you have a species in your analysis that has very low count? And I've seen, so in, in, in genetics, how we deal with it is for GWAS like this, if the number is too small, we won't have power to detect small, small numbers. And what happens when you're trying to establish associations with things for which you don't have power, what happens, you expose yourself to false positive findings which become more likely than true positive findings. Okay, so typically we will not use statistical approaches that are underpowered to detect something. In your microbiome world, I've seen different approaches used and for, it, for this. This may be a hot topic. So some people will say, well, if the strain is absent, we'll ignore it. And in individuals where we see the strain, then we'll count in that individual. So you're basically ignoring samples where the strain was not observed and putting that aside. This is, um, in my view, not the best approach. You need to have a modeling approach that can capture in your regression model, in your statistical test, those individuals where the, the, that species was not observed. Okay, so in genetics, what we do, uh, we, can, we can use binning. I'm not, I'm not a big fan of binning. So you take a gene and you say, if I have a mutation that's very rare, less than 5%, in one position, I will combine it with a mutation that's very rare in another position and bin them together and use that in a test. In your world... But, but sorry, for these po two positions, they have to be in uh, linkage disequilibrium? Or? No, they don't have... So the two rare variants don't have to be in linkage disequilibrium. There has to be a, a functional biological reason for binning them together. So typically it will be they're in the same exon, they're in the same gene. In your microbial world, it would be they're in the same family of species, they're in the same... Okay? So that would be the kind of binning that could be considered for low counts. Okay, I'm moving on because I'm never going to teach. Just uh, <coughs> over at least 15, 20 minutes <laughs> Before more questions. Okay, so this uh, brings us to that second paper in the November Nature Genetics issue where they decided to go all out for uh, microbiome. Um, statistically, I preferred this one. You may not like it as well for uh, the reason here. So in this study, they had slightly more individuals, so 1,800 Europeans from two cohorts. The GWAS approach was very similar. They were a bit more strict on the quality of SNPs, which I like. But here's where it's the first. They didn't do uh, shotgun sequencing. They used 16S. And so, as some of you will agree, you lose some information here. It's not as precise. So they had 38 phyla and three, over 300 genera that were uh, analyzed. And they did a shotgun analysis, but it was follow-up work, and it's not part of the main discovery. The outcomes, what they were modeling in this uh, study here, is beta diversity <coughs> and bacterial abundance. So I think it's quite a classical kind of approach. And they labeled their, uh, their paper genome-wide association analysis, so GWAS, identifies variation in the vitamin D receptor and other host factors influencing gut microbiome. So they found a number of things, but they decided to highlight one of their findings in their title. So I, quite clearly, they thought that the excitement of their discovery was in the vitamin D receptor, and I would tend to agree. What's really nice about this analysis is uh, the, the care they took into modeling the different factors that can have an impact. And here, uh, it's the beta diversity. So they're basically looking at the factors of diet, age, body mass index, smoking or not, and sex, and how that has an impact of what we're looking at here, our principal coordinates analysis. <coughs> 
looking how age, BMI, will push the principal coordinate analysis, if you can fathom this in your imagination, how the effect would be acting. And also, uh, with respect to the different elements in the diet. So they had a food frequency questionnaire, and uh, they structured the different parts of their food frequency questionnaires into units. Protein, energy, sugar, fat, water. And so by creating those scores of units in the diet, they could include those as covariates in the model. And so what we see here is the proportion of variance in the outcome, the better diversity, that can be explained by those variables. So we see that diet is quite important, age, BMI, smoking, slightly in sex, and we had this discussion last night, sex has a very small effect, I, I misunderstood this. So we, we, we see here that sex is only small. I'm moving on. This is a display of the results they have in a circular plot, and we like colors, admit it. And what we're looking at on the right-hand side of that circle are the 22 human chromosomes. You'll say, wait a minute, there are 23 chromosomes, and it's true. And these people made a major mistake. They did not analyze the X chromosome. It's you had your sex gender uh, person give you a talk about the sex chromosome. And on the other side of that circle, what we're looking at is the mouse genome. Now, they did not do a mouse genome analysis in here. They're basically cross-linking any of their hits that they had with hits previously known and established in the mouse, as if this would be a reinforcement of evidence towards the hit that they're finding. Okay, so um, we see here the genes, and it's hard to read, but the number of the genes that were associated with beta, the beta diversity and individual taxon, and whether or not they link. And they don't go through details of all of those hits, but they focus on the vitamin D receptor. Oops, another way. Well, so why are we interested in the vitamin D receptor? Well, the vitamin D receptor is a human transcription factor. It plays many roles, but it's a transcription factor. And it forms a heterodimer. It's very well studied. It's, in, it's in, implicated in, a num in the regulation of a number of genes. And it forms a heterodimer with the retinoid X receptor, another X, uh, nuclear uh, transcription factor. And it basically lives its life by activating the expression of genes. That's what it does. And so it's particularly interesting here because it's not the first time that it's been associated. So this is, this is like a nice confirmation, and, and they felt confident about this finding. What they saw here, and they did model that, you know, the individuals who did not have a specific, the presence of a specific tax species in their gut, and they ignored those individuals, they used that, which I don't agree with, but they try to mod model it. So the percentage of people with non-zero value for the parabacteroid, uh, so in their sample, so we, with respect to the vitamin D receptor genotype, so we see that TT individuals here behave differently from the CC and CT people. And I'm going to go back one slide. Oh, no. Oh, I guess I didn't show you that. And uh, so we see that those individuals have uh, the TT individuals at this SNP that was associated uh, with the abundance with the better diversity, we see that they have smaller abundance of that specific species. So this is what happened when people have been doing GWASs with uh, diversity. Once they establish association of a SNP with diversity, right, of a, uh, right away they want to know, well, which species is overexpressed, you know, in that diversity? So that's what they attempted to do, and this is what they report. So we're looking at statistics that come out of over, so 1,800 individuals. And uh, this is the highlight of the paper. 
This brings us to the second set of examples that we're going to look at. Remember, we said we were going to look at GWAS association, GWAS is an association with the gut microbiome, drug modulating the microbiome, and lastly, we're going to look at genome genome interaction. So now we're on the drug second set of examples. So two things. Drugs can impact the microbiome, but the microbiome can impact the drug activity. And we have a few examples here of how this can occur. So first of all, when, for, for those of you who are not familiar, when we take medications, I'm not talking recreation, recreational <laughs> drugs acting on the cannabinoid receptor. I'm talking medication to treat diseases. When we take medications, some of those medications will be active. So we open the box, take it in. The, the medication we're, we're taking in is active. Sometimes that medication is not active. It needs to be metabolized to become active. This second kind is called prodrug. So it's like proto-drug. It will become a drug, but it's not drug drug yet. So prodrug. So prodrugs typically need to be metabolized before they become active. And there are examples of drugs that can be metabolized by the gut to make them active. And then there are active drugs that we take in that can be metabolized by the gut, and then they become inactive. And we're going to see one example of that. And there are examples also of drugs that uh, may become toxic after being metabolized, drugs that can inhibit microbiome, antibiotics quite clearly will do that, and uh, some drugs that could favor the growth of uh, specific bugs. And we're going to see an example of that. So we're going to see the example of metformin with the selective bacterial growth and digoxin, uh, where the gut microbiome is making the drug inactive. Okay, so let's start that by the example with metformin. This is a recent publication. It was published in May 2017, so quite fresh. And I was personally very excited when I saw this publication. Metformin alters the gut microbiome of people with type 2 diabetes. And this alteration contributes to the therapeutic effects of the drug. Now, this was big news because uh, metformin is a drug that's broadly used for the treatment of diabetes. And uh, it's an old drug. It's cheap. And its mechanism of action is poorly understood. Nowadays, most drugs that are developed and put on the market, we understand their mechanism of action. But uh, older drugs that passed you know, approval years ago, sometimes they pass without really knowing how it works. And metformin is one of those drugs. And so this is why it was so interesting. Now. This is an example of microbiome drug interaction. It's not a GWAS. We're not looking at genetic variations in, in the host that would interplay. I'm sure there are variations that will impact how metformin impacts the microbiome, but this is not the question that was asked in this study. It was a uh, randomized, placebo-controlled intervention, double-blind, so this is an experimental study. It's not observational. They had a hypothesis, and they tested it. So this is ge generating solid evidence as a result of hypothesis testing, not a fishing experiment. We're looking for things that are modulated. This is a dedicated study where they wanted to see whether metformin affected diversity in the gut. Only uh, less than 40 individuals in the study, small study on any genetic standard, but remember, it's not a genetic study. First thing they saw, they drew blood, and they saw that uh, the intervention, so okay, let's look at those graphs. We're looking at a measurement, so we have BMI, glycated hemoglobin, and glucose, 
And on the x-axis, they're basically just plotting in a histogram placebo measurements from, uh, from individuals in the placebo arm and measurements from individuals in the metformin arm. Measurements were taken at baseline, so time zero, after two months of treatment and after four months of treatment in both placebo and metformin. What we see here, and I have to say those individuals, they had never ever been exposed to any diabetes drug and they were randomized, placebo or metformin. So metformin would be the first drug that they're using for the treatment of diabetes. Plus, they were put on a strict, low-calorie diet. Obviously, they had di diabetes issues, so something had to be done, and lifestyle intervention is typically recommended, so this was a normal course uh, for this in intervention. First thing we saw is that in both arms, placebo or metformin, they lost weight. Good news, that's the impact of the diet. And this is very important for us because if we're going to see how metformin affects the gut, we want to know, is it just because the person is losing weight that the gut is changing? Or is it really because metformin is doing something? So in people lost weight in both arms, the glycated hemoglobin, which is a measurement of how severe their uh, diabetes is, uh, improved in the intervention arm, in the metformin <laughs> arm, but not in the placebo arm until they did that extended crossover study. After six months, they took the individual in the placebo arm and put them all on metformin to see, to control for intra-individual variability. And fasting glucose improved also in that crossover arm of the placebo group. So that's not microbiome. That's just how are the patients doing. Now, what happened? So they, were, uh, they looked at different things. They looked at strain abundance. And here we're looking at the significant uh, strains where there has been a change between baseline and two months or baseline and four months. In the placebo, there was no change in those that had a change in the metformin arm. And those symbols represent statistically significant findings. And here what we see is that in those significant findings, there was some enrichment of some species. They did something interesting in this study. They looked at microbial growth induced by metformin. And so previously we saw the results of the primary study where, where the intervention was happening. But they also did fecal transplant of those individuals that were exposed to metformin and put them in diabetic mice to see whether it could rescue the diabetic mice. And it did for the metformin-treated individuals. And they did a number, they really wanted to understand what was happening in the metformin-treated gut. And one thing, one analysis they did, and I'm not ex an expert and I'm just telling you because I thought it was quite neat. They did something they called the peak to through ratio. They're basically uh, following shotgun sequencing, looking at reads, DNA reads that map at the origin of DNA replication versus the end of DNA replication within strains. So that they could un identify those strains that were actively replicating more. And they saw a significant finding where there was a difference in the metformin-treated gut versus the placebo gut for bifido adolescentis, which is a very common bug, and uh, they cultured also uh, the, the, fe the, the fecal specimens, and they saw that in the presence of metformin, this bug was growing more, so they supported this finding, and so this is part of the results and the conclusion of this study. That's all I had to say about metformin. I'm going to give you another example of how there can be a drug and a microbiome interaction. And it's the example of digoxin. 
Digoxin is a drug that's used for the treatment of heart failure. It's still used. It. That's another old drug, cheap, broadly used, and uh, for the treatment of heart failure and some cardiac arrhythmias. And this drug, and this has been known for a while now, 1981, can be inactivated by bacteria in the gut, and in particular, E. lenta in the gut. And what happens when people take digoxin, if they have E. lenta, it will metabolize the drug and render it inactive. And so when the doctors are dosing, you know, trying to find what the right dose is for the patient, they need to up the dose to get physiological effects. And so they up the dose in those patients that have more bug. And this could be of a concern because digoxin has a very narrow therapeutic index. And so if you change the dose, you could be, you could be exposing the patient to adverse events. Or if you're undertreated, well, patients with heart failure are sick patients and they need treatment. This treatment is important for them. So monitoring is essential. And this led to the creation of a project that is ongoing between Jacques Corbet's lab and my group. And we have Jeremy, who's a student with you in this course, who's working on this. So the hypothesis we put forth is maybe what happens when patients uh, are using digoxin, one situation that could happen is that whenever those individuals are treated with antibiotics, this could change the metabolism of the drug and it could expose patients to overdose. So what Jeremy has been doing is looking at what happens to the abundance of E. lenta <coughs> in gut samples of healthy volunteers exposed to uh, broad spectrum antibiotics. And this is what we see. So ceprazil administration for seven days. We have day zero, day seven, and day 90 after three months. And we have uh, some individuals did not have the bug, some did. And what we see is we see a trend for a reduction in the presence of E. lenta after exposure to antibiotics. And that this reduction is stable even after three months. Now, sample size was on the small side. And now, of course, remember, those P patients were not taking uh, digoxin. So it's just a theoretical experiment. Now, Frédéric and Jacques have been working uh, by, with the cultures in the lab. So there has been growth of uh, samples from those patients in the lab. And what we see is that when we expose uh, the samples to another anti broad spectrum antibiotics, we also sh see a reduction in the presence of Elanta in those samples. And uh, this time it was significant because the sample size was slightly larger. <clears throat> and I want to finish with another example, which I think is quite exciting for going forward with uh, this. The kind of interaction analyses we can do between the host genome and the microbiome, and uh, they've been called genome-to-genome -genome analyses. Now, we're not talking about gut microbiome. We're talking about hepatitis C virus <clears throat> uh, in circulation in patients. So genome-to-genome -genome analysis, published in May 2017, highlights the effect of human innate and adaptive immune system on hepatitis C virus. Remember, we said that uh, the microbiome viruses adapt. We're not born with it. They adapt. They, so whenever we treat ourselves, there's an adaptation. And so this adaptation and evolution occurs for hepatitis C as well. So they did this very interesting study using 600 hepatitis C infected patients who were taking part in a clinical trial. But this study is not a clinical trial. This study is an observational study. 
of samples that were sampled as part of a clinical trial. And so they had baseline plasma that they used for whole genome sequencing of the virus. So they sequenced the virus. They also had the host DNA. So they, they did genotyping. And as we saw before, genotyped, imputed. So they had genetic variants for, it, for the 600 individuals in this study. And one thing to remember is that human key lymphocytes will attack the virus. And depending on the kind of immune system the patient has, HLA variants can have an effect on how well it attacks the virus and what escape mechanisms are left for the virus to survive. So this was the major interest in, in conducting this study. So a few words on the, and I'm not an expert, on the hepatitis C virus. There are seven major types. And hepatitis C3 is the type that was of particular interest. It's the most prevalent virus. And uh, also, it's the type that has the most uh, resistance to treatment. So they did this genome-to-genome -genome analysis. It's a busy slide, but it's a beautiful slide. So again, we see the circle plot, and we have the human chromosome. And again, they only have 22 chromosomes. And basically what they're doing is that with each one of those SNPs, they're asking the question, is my SNP one going over millions of SNPs? SNP number one, is it associated with specific positions in the virus genome? But they didn't use the genome. They did a very elegant thing here. So they had sequenced the <coughs> genome of the virus, remember? And of course, viruses are dynamic. They don't have one strain copy of the virus. There's multiple different copies and different copies of, of the virus. And so what they did is they asked the question, does that nucleotide change alter an amino acid? And what amino acid is encoded? So the association was performed at the amino acid level. So that was one way of reducing the variation in the viral genome. Now, amino acids are not like four bases of nucleotides. It's like many amino acids. So they had declinations of, of observed encoding of amino acid at each position. And they normalized this to have a quantitative endpoint. So what we're looking at here on the top circle are the genes, or the proteins, encoded by the virus. And the, the viral genome is pretty small. Uh, it has over 3,000 amino acids, and they saw variation only in 1,200 amino acids in the virus. And they tested for association each position with each amino acid. So how many statistical tests are we talking about here? We said when we do a genome-wide association analysis, we adjust for a million tests. So we have at least a million SNPs in the genome. And we have a thousand amino acids, so a million by a thousand. So the significance threshold here was established at 10 to the negative 11. So we have 10 to 5 times 10 to the negative 8. And we add a few zeros to that, brings us to 11. OK. Outer minipanel, viral diversity. So they tested for viral diversity. Uh, they had, oh, this is what we're looking at. And so this plot is the density of SNPs. Obviously, the, oops, the distribution of SNPs in the genome is not uniform. Those, those tests that we do, they SNPs can lump in specific regions, and they wanted to express that. Typically, in the genome, we have less diversity near the centromeres, so we have fewer, fewer variants located near the centromere, and this is what this is depicted. So what they did these, the analyses is they did 
logistic regression. Also, oh, it was model zero one. Sorry, logistic regression, additive model for the SNP, and they adjusted for sex. There are sex-based differences in the human genome, so it's quite relevant. Even though you may think the microbiome is not influenced by sex, here we're talking about viruses, and it's not even the gut. The way that the host genome will act in the body can very well be modulated by sex. And we're safer to add sex in our model than to confound our results by sex, the risk confounding our results by sex. And they adjusted for geographical origin of the individuals by using principal component analysis based on the genetics of the people. And they also adjusted for the diversity of the virus by using principal components from the virus as covariates in the model. Findings, so it's tables and tables, and this is a truncated table of the findings. So very few signals pass the pre-established significance threshold, but in the tables they're showing the sub-significant also because people like to look at data. There's a fascination with data. So what are they reporting? They're reporting the p-value, uh, and they did for the association, the whole population, and they did a subgroup analysis in Caucasian white population, just because genetic associations are so sensitive to confounding by geographical origin that you want to do a subgroup analysis just to be safe that what you're seeing is not a fake result. Okay, so what's the take home message from this study? Here we're looking at, uh, again, a Manhattan plot, all of the chromosomes in the human, sort of, and looking at viral load, and they found an interesting association with one gene, INFNL4, involved in the immune response, and uh, they show how different genotypes uh, will affect the, uh, the, the different viral load of their patients. And I'm ending on this. I think that this study is quite promising, looking forward for the possibilities that we have to do genome-to-genome -genome analysis uh, with large number, and uh, you will have understood by now that we're going to be needing large numbers, large cohorts. So Jacques, if you want to do shotgun sequencing on thousands of samples, I'll analyze the data. And uh, what have we seen? We saw host genetics can impact the gut microbiome. We had two examples from that uh, Nature Genetics uh, edition. <coughs> We've seen that drug microbiome, there are drug microbiome interactions. We saw two examples, metformin and digoxin. And we saw an example of genome-to-genome -genome analysis. Very few of those, only two in the literature. So the hepatitis C virus, as we saw, there was also an analysis with the HIV virus, which I didn't talk about here. Looking forward, sequencing is cheap. It's getting cheaper and cheaper, so there is a real possibility for uh, large data availability. Longitudinal analyses and repeated measures of gut samples and microbial samples is very important. It helps reduce the variability. It helps us explain the observed variability that are due to the within individual effect and account for that in the statistical model. <clears throat> I've heard talks, I've heard things, and there's interest in the pharma from the pharmaceutical industry to study the microbiome, to see how it affects drugs that are in development, but also the potential for developing drugs that target the microbiome, which is now a real factor in health and disease. And for you guys in this workshop, my two cents of wisdom is you should look forward to the establishment of guidelines to standardize methods, to benchmark novel methods. When you develop a new tool, don't stop there. Benchmark it against as many tools available 
making the data available, and uh, promoting bench benchmarking will help establish useful guidelines for uh, methodologies. That's it. Questions? Question. Thanks for the, the talk. Great talk. Um, so you mentioned it early, uh, it was a genome-wide association study. <clears throat> there was a high risk of false positive. It's based on the number of associations made. So <coughs> did they find a lot of findings or less than you would expect because of that? Okay, so in the field of human genetics, uh, we had to tackle the problem of false positive association due to multiple testing in early 2000s, late 90s. This, when SNPs appeared, when genotyping panels appeared, people started testing small cohorts of 200s with many, many variants. And we realized that a lot of the findings weren't being replicated. That, and it was at the time where, when we did not have guidelines, strict guidelines to help us you know, into the developing the methodologies for approach. And it's with years of, of uh, hindsight that I, I can tell you that you will benefit from those methodologies to make sure that, you know, there's some sort of community-wide standardized methods that can be used and can be looked for. So in the human genetics world, uh, there was a time, an epoch, where false positive signals were rampant and uh, around 2008, 2007, the, the major journals uh, said, that's it. From now on, we're not publishing a single GWAS paper unless it has a replication embedded within the study design. And so all of a sudden, the number of publications dropped radically, and it promoted collaborations between teams and the generation of super large cohorts. So this is how our uh, host genomics community has adapted to the pressure of making sure that we're not publishing false things. I'm not sure that answers your question, well, though. Well, I was just curious, um, from your opinion, from your point of view, did they find a lot of things or little findings? So there's a lot of GWAS findings. There's the online, if you're curious, there's something called the GWAS catalog. And it lists thousands of associations that have been established. And I think, and actually going forward, as I was looking at the microbiome uh, publications coming out, a lot of people are now interested in focusing on SNPs in the host that are known to be correlated with disease and asking precisely that specific SNP, how does it affect the microbiome and how could that relate to health and disease? So I think that that's also one venue that we may be seeing in the near future. I had a question here, am I, no? Um, with regards to the hepatitis C study, have you looked for um sort of an increase in, in SNP variability in the regions that the MHC would bind to in order to escape the, uh, the immune system? Remember, this is not my study. <laughs> I'm just teaching you guys what's out there. Uh, have they looked at how a specific variability in the viral genome that may be adapting? Look, if, I was a, if I was a bacteria and I entered a human that had a specific MHC binding complex, I would try to to mutate my regions and bind to that mm. more so than the other regions. Yeah, and that finding that they highlighted, the IFNL4 finding was precise, precisely about that, how, regarding the host variant and how that has an impact on how well the virus adapts. That was, I went, sorry, I went quickly, I wanted to be on time. But that was precisely what they were looking for in the paper. Question. Um, I have a question. It's not related to the papers that you presented. It's more um, a methodology question, and I was interested in, interested in your take on um, microbiome when you started to address the words of you know, wisdom. You, you did highlight the fact that it's this dynamic uh, process. So, from, a, from an analysis standpoint, how do you see? the future of like how we analyze data that changes over time. You know, you're going to have samples at time one, time two, time three, time four, so on and so forth. People are going to collaborate. We're going to get more data. So what type of, what type of uh, methodology in terms of statistical analysis or just how do you deal with this type of data? 
Oh, we can. We, you can. we can use hierarchical modeling. We can do a lot of nifty things with it. Uh, my take on it is that we're going to need to understand better how the dynamics works. So we, we as humans, we like to sim simplify things so that we can model them. But in, we first, I think, need to understand what is the dynamics of the different strains, different situations, the daily cycles, how that is taken into account, but also the longitudinal. So some bugs will replicate faster than others, some will adapt faster than others, and going longitudinally, so as we saw with the digoxin, some with the Elenta in the presence of antibiotics, uh, some may not come back that easily. Some will come back easily, but some won't. And what are the factors involved in that? So the factors involved in the dynamic, so and how different strains, what are the characteristics of, of that cycling? Is it daily? Is it weekly? Is it monthly? And how fast it bounces back from an, an intervention? I think that that will help us model the dynamic of the data. And going forward in terms of longitudinal analysis, it's the more data, the better. That's always the bottom line. And uh, and it's the sampling, if good, if it can be, and that's methodologies. It's not analysis as systematic as possible, you know, and as consistent between sites as possible, and on as many people as possible. Mm -hmm.